Predation is one of the most significant dynamics that can be observed in an ecosystem. It's been at the root of the Cambrian explosion, one of the major diversification events in life's history. As an incredibly powerful driver of coevolution, the process by which two or more species evolve in relation to one another, it is surprising that its development or evolution is so hard to replicate. Together, I want to explore what kind of dynamics are necessary for predation to develop in an ecosystem and what can be done to encourage it. In order to do so, we'll try making predation possible in my artificial life project, the Bibbits. The Bibbits is an artificial life simulation where I developed a new type of life that is entirely digital. I simulate some biological processes and allow the life forms, Bibbits, to live eat, reproduce, and evolve following natural selection. The bibbits have genes that dictate their physical and biological characteristics, and a brain, a custom neural network algorithm of my own design that allows them to evolve their behavior, memory, and capacities. I've been working on the project since 2015, but only recently took the decision of dedicating my full time and attention to furthering its development. Welcome to the fascinating world of the Bibbits. The one dynamic which is hailed as the holy grail of artificial life is predation. While it's an essential part of any of Hertz ecosystem and a powerful driver of coevolution, it remains an elusive dynamic in most artificial life simulations. The few projects which display predation have hard-coded it in less than satisfying ways, anyways negating the potential benefits it promises to bring. I've always wanted to see predator-prey relations in action in my project and I've recently started an epic quest to uncover the secrets, conditions, and dynamics that would make it possible. This is going to be the first episode of a series of videos where I'll share my journey with you. First of all, it's important to define predation. It may seem obvious, but the exact definition is not agreed upon. Most often, we say that predation is the biological interaction where one organism, the predator, kills and eats another organism, the prey. We can see that this definition is pretty vague and broad, as it would technically describe many herbivores too. The plants they consume are organisms too, after all. It can also describe a range of feeding strategies, as there's a lot of overlap but for the purpose of this video, we'll focus on carnivores hunting herbivores. Organisms, by definition, are sources of energy. Like any other source of energy, they provide an opportunity for other life forms to exploit, if possible. The sum of all the conditions and adaptations necessary to exploit a given source of energy is what we call an ecological niche. As an example, in a simple environment where we only have three ecological niches, we have a species of plants filling the niche of autotrophs that get their energy from the sun, a species of bugs that eat the plants, and a species of lizards that eat the bugs. This environment is stable, and each of those niches is filled by a single species that is extremely adapted to this environment and prevents any other species from eventually exploiting the same niche. <laughs> no, no, no! If suddenly a new species of flying bugs evolved to have easier access to higher leaves and no flying predators that could eat them <laughs> exist, they will now present a new untapped opportunity. Other life forms will now have an incentive to adapt and evolve to fill that unexploited niche. After all, it is a source of nutrition and energy that presents far less competition. The species that's the closest to already having the right adaptations will usually fill the niche first. You might start to understand why Earth's ecosystems are as dynamic and complex as they are. 
The continuously shifting landscape of available niches and species that filled them thanks to specific adaptations, adaptations that might eventually allow them to better compete for existing niches or fill new niches when the opportunity comes. You can't blame me for wanting to capture some of that and make the bibbits display the same amount of dynamism and complexity. Obviously, we all know that in practice, evolution works in small increments. In order for species to evolve and fill a new niche, the transition needs to be both possible and viable. This means that the transitionary species need to profit, or at least not suffer too much, from their gradual evolution. Hello, darkness, my old friend. This is called an evolutionary pathway, the path through the evolutive space which a species must take to manage to fill and reach a new niche. As another simple example, imagine a graph describing all the possible genes combinations that the species can display, what we call the genetic domain. Let's use color as the single gene that exists in an ecosystem. If something in that environment instantly kills anything white enough, let's say an all-powerful god that really loves vibrant colors, and we have a red species that wanted to fill a niche requiring the color teal, the species wouldn't be able to take the shortest evolutionary path and would have to take an alternative road to be able to fill the niche. An unexploited ecological niche in an ecosystem in which no species have a clear pathway to it will usually stay empty. On Earth, most ecosystems are big and dynamic enough that any unexploited niche will eventually be. But this poses a bigger problem when we have simpler systems with less potential for emergence, like in most artificial life simulations. Many simulations often contain only one or very few ecological niches. Because of the low dimensionality of the genetic domain, this leaves very few opportunities for viable evolutionary pathways. Those concepts still apply for the evolution of carnivory and predation. If we only have a population of herbivores, there needs to be a well-defined and viable enough path that would lead them there. So not only do we have the already difficult task of making predation a viable niche, we also need to make the evolution of predation possible. Knowing all this and the difficult journey that awaited me, I still decided that I wanted to give it a go. So. Buckle up. A while back, I allowed the possibility of consuming different food types and a gene controlling which food type would give the most energy to an individual. There's plants which grow passively, producing a reliable source of energy into the simulation, and meat which is dropped by bibbits when they die, containing an amount of energy proportional to their size and other genetic factors, but that decay over time, making it temporary. Additionally, bibbits have the capacity to hurt each other. They can bite others, grapple one another, and even throw stuff at each other. Like previously said, a bibbit that has received enough damage will release the energy contained in the form of meat pellets. Just like in the real world. <laughs> All of this, combined with the simulation allowing the evolution of their behavior in response to different foods, I figured that this would be enough to allow the evolution of predatory dynamics. However, here we are. Aside from extreme modifications to the simulation's parameters, like preventing meat from rotting or making meat grow just like plants, which allowed some of my users to let carnivore population develop, Herbivory always seemed to be the optimal choice. In order to test if stable predator-prey ecosystems could even exist, if predation was a viable niche, I tried engineering my own species. I first let a stable herbivore populations develop to equilibrium. 
then introduced some carnivore bibbits I engineered so that they would chase and kill others, then feast on their corpses. After a lot of experiments and tuning, I was overjoyed when I saw that the two populations entered a seemingly stable predator-prey dynamic. I was seeing all the desired outcomes, like oscillating populations resulting from overchasing cycles and impressive coevolution, herbivores evolving better eyes to try their best to avoid the predators, predators evolving luck and targeting torpedo-style behavior to catch their preys off guard, herbivores evolving to herd together to protect themselves through numbers, and so on. The simulation was more dynamic than ever. But sadly, this didn't last. The herbivores kept evolving and eventually reached a point where they were too hard to catch. The predators, having a harder and harder time attaining their main food source, went into extinction. Looking at this simulation from the perspective of ecological niches, because of the competition amongst themselves, we see that the initial herbivore population evolved to be very optimized, limiting their movement as much as possible to conserve energy and having a very slow metabolism. After adding my predators to the empty niche, they managed to hunt, kill, and eat their prey just fine. This placed an evolutive pressure on the herbivores that were now being hunted because of their slowness. However, as the herbivores became better and better, the maximum sustainable population of carnivores decreased gradually. As the competition for meat decreased and it became more abundant, a subspecies split from the predator population and stopped pursuing prey altogether, instead feeding on the corpses of dead bibbits, which was a far easier food source. The predator population eventually went extinct because they couldn't maintain a sufficient advantage over their prey. With the predators gone, and the incentive towards speed and agility they brought with them disappearing, both remaining species went back to instead competing amongst themselves and optimizing for efficiency. I tried it again a few times, but always ended up with the same results. The conclusion was clear. Herbivores were far too OP. Following a lot of thinking, as well as many discussions with members of the community on social medias, the answer became clear. Plants themselves, as a food source, had to become worse. This is why your opinions are so important to me. When trying to do something new that has never really been done, it helps a lot to think outside the box and have access to as many ideas as possible. So I encourage you to leave a comment under this video with your ideas and reach out on social medias like Reddit and Twitter. In the end, I settled on an old idea I presented in one of my first videos, digestion, which I completely forgot about and rediscovered thanks to your collective help in making me see it in a new light. In the next video, we'll explore how I implemented materials and digestion to the simulation to try and make predation a tiny bit more viable. If you want to follow the progress of this quest to create a new type of life, subscribe to the channel and ring the notification bell. If you've already seen the previous video, you'll know that the Bibbits have received an enormous visual upgrade since last time. This is all thanks to the incredible work of Brax, an artist that has been helping out the project for a long time and has made the procedural appearance of the Bibbits a reality. If you have even just a minute to spare, take the time to reach out on Twitter and share what you loved about the new visuals. Just before leaving you with the end of video simulation, I want to thank the people making this possible. While the project is not completely financially viable, my supporters on Patreon are helping it tremendously. Thanks to their support, I've been able to purchase uh, new tools and programs that allow me to push this project further. I can't express my gratitude enough. The end of video simulation is my attempt at making you a literal part of the project. Thank you especially to Alex Sawyer and DVGen, two rock stars that have a big place in my heart. 
Alex has started helping out with the project and is being of incredible help. He is officially gaining the title of collaborator many times over. Divijen is a scientist and indie developer working on artificial life and emergence. Check out his project on Twitter. So finally, thank you for watching and I hope to see you next time.